Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing practical security advice along the way. I'm your show host and all-around security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting August 24th, 2015. Let's go ahead and cover this week's three security bites. So today's news has to be further updates about the Ashley Madison breach, just because there's so much new news around this big hack. It started with the Toronto police holding a press conference where they shared some new detail. For instance, victims that found the extortion message had their computers playing an ACDC track called Thunderstruck. Also, the police unfortunately shared that there's been two suicides that seem to be related to the data leaked in this Ashley Madison case. And finally, the police offered a $500,000 reward for anybody that can help track down uh, the people behind this particular attack. Besides that, there's been a lot of gossipy stories going around the data that's been leaked. For instance, Ashley Madison's CEO's emails were leaked, and some people are starting to look through those emails and find a lot of interesting information. For instance, the CTO of the company uh, a few years ago said that the security of the company was rather weak and he was concerned about it, which is quite interesting in itself. But more importantly, there seems to be an email where the CTO seems to admit that he was hacking Nerve.com, an Ashley Madison competitor and using web application flaws like cross-site scripting uh, and other flaws, he was able to get their database and other information from this competitor, which is outright illegal and concerning that a company would do that. There's also some researchers that have started brute forcing the credentials leaked in this breach. And while Ashley Madison uses bcrypt, which is harder to brute force, or slower, I should say, uh, he was still able to brute force 4,000 weak passwords, which of course were very, very bad passwords you should never use. Most recently, a couple couple of people have started to say they think they know who's behind this attack. It started with the eccentric John McAfee, a millionaire and ex-security company person, that says he believes it's a lone female hacker. Now I'll link to his article, but really I don't think he shares very compelling evidence. On the other hand, Brian Krebs from Krebs on Security, with some help from some researchers, have identified a particular Twitter handle that seems to have some foreknowledge of this breach. It's clear it's someone that knows how to hack. It seems to also be someone that knows of Thunderstruck and was doing posts that coincide quite well with the timeline of this particular breach. Now the Twitter handle does not seem to be a real profile or person. It seems to be a faked account and it might be even using some misdirection. But it seems pretty clear that the author of this Twitter handle either knows who's responsible for the breach or is actually taking part in it too. Finally, I need to warn you that cyber criminals are actually taking advantage of the data leaked in this breach. Among other things, they're starting to extort the email addresses from Ashley Madison's database. They might contact you and say, if you don't give us approximately one Bitcoin, we're going to let people know you were part of this site. Now, in reality, this is really a bad extortion attempt, and uh, hopefully you're not a member of Ashley Madison, but if you're worried about it, you should not succumb to this extortion. Because frankly, your email is already out there. This data is out there. There's already sites where anyone can search to see if you were in Ashley Madison's database. So there's really no point in paying one Bitcoin to criminals. But do you realize if you were in Ashley Madison's database, you should definitely be concerned about your email address, change your credit cards, and make sure you're using new passwords at all the sites you visit. Anyways, just a very interesting case. We'll continue to share updates if there's any relevant information. Today's story is a new batch of consumer router holes. Today, U.S. CERT released a new advisory describing vulnerabilities that affected a wide range of consumer routers that are used around the world. These are devices from ASUS, Digicom, ZTE, and many other ISPs out there, specifically the DSL routers they might give to their customers. Actually, this is based on a vulnerability that was found in a ZTE router months ago. It was found that this router had a backdoor, a mysterious, uh, unmarketed administrator administrative account that had a hard-coded password. And the password was basically the MAC address of the router with AeroCon following that MAC address. This new CERT advisory warns that many different routers out there have this same vulnerability, presumably because they use the same firmware or chipset as this previous router. Now, how big a deal is this flaw? Well, apparently the routers expose Telenet and SNMP. 
And because they expose Telenet in SNMP, it means that any attacker who can Telenet to your router might be able to use this hidden account to log in and gain root access to your router. Now, one of the mitigating factors is the fact that you have to know the MAC address of the router. Typically, this would limit this to just a local attack. But the problem is, since the routers support SNMP, this allows a mechanism for an external person to perhaps get the MAC address of your router. And he, once he has that address, he can actually log into your router. Now, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a solid fix for this problem. The manufacturer that creates this hard-coded uh, password in their firmware doesn't seem to be in a hurry to actually change this password. But what they do say is you can mitigate this flaw by actually using the firewall on your router and disabling access to Telenet and SNMP. That's not going to prevent local attackers from trying to exploit this flaw, but it could uh, prevent people on the internet from doing it. In any case, be sure to check out the link to the CERT advisory I post to make sure that you're not using one of the vulnerable routers. Today's story is a watering hole attack that's leveraging the EFF. You've probably heard of the EFF or the Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's an organization that tries to fight for the digital rights of everybody online. In any case, there seems to be a new spear phishing campaign that's actually using them in the attack. Google recently found a new malicious domain called electronicfrontierfoundation.org. Do not go to that site. The real EFF site is actually just EFF.org. In any case, there seems to be some very targeted spear phishing emails that reference this domain. And if you actually go to this domain, it leverages a relatively new uh, Java vulnerability, one that was just a zero day a month ago, to install malicious code on your computer. In fact, it seems to be a cross-platform attack. There seems to be some script that can pick between a Windows or a Unix-based attack, so it might target Linux, Mac, and Windows computers. In fact, there's also some evidence that this is related to another attack campaign we've heard about in the past. Some people call it the Pond Storm campaign, others call it APT28, but in any case it seems to be a campaign that's launched by Russian threat actors and has targeted many governmental organizations in the past. It's kind of curious how they're using the Electronic Frontier Foundation as part of their lure. In any case, the good news is the spear phishing email is very, very targeted, and the site, though it's still up now, is on a lot of the known malware domain lists, so a lot of people will block it. So the takeaways are simple. Do not go to the Electronic Frontier Foundation foundation.org site. Be very, very careful if you get any email referencing the EFF. And finally, use products that can prevent you from going to malicious domains, such as WatchGuard's web blocker. Well, that's it this week. I hope you found it informative. And as always, please join and subscribe to our blog. It's found at blog.watchguard.com or watchguardsecuritycenter.com. And that's where I post this video. And besides seeing this video, you can actually see the reference section where there's links to many other security stories I may not have been able to cover during each week. You can also follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. And finally, I'm sometimes unable to blog about my videos as quickly as I post the video, so if you want to get the videos immediately, feel free to follow my YouTube channel as well. One other show note, I'll be traveling in Europe all next week, so I probably will not be able to make as many videos as I do normally. So I'll try to make as many as I can, but they're probably not going to be posted at their normal time. So again, thank you for watching, and as always, here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.